Hey, let me go ahead and introduce John to you. John comes to us from Southern Illinois. Um, he has served in the past as a research agronomist for University of Illinois at Dixon Springs, a research station there. He's also served in, as an extension educator with Southern Illinois University, Lakeland College. And lately, he's been doing a lot of work with farmers across Illinois and elsewhere on precision cover cropping. That's what we're going to look at today, as well as providing some education opportunities to ag retailers through some projects with TNC. Um, also want to give a big shout out to Jody Etheridge with the Williamson County SWCD. She's out there with John today, helping him run all of this stuff. So with that, live to you, John. Hey, let me go ahead and introduce John to you. John comes to us from Southern Illinois. Um, he has served in the past as a research agronomist for University of Illinois at Dixon Springs, a research station there. He's also served in ex as an extension educator with Southern Illinois University, Lakeland College. And lately, he's been doing a lot of work with farmers across Illinois and elsewhere on precision cover cropping. That's what we're going to look at today, as well as providing some education opportunities to ag retailers through some projects with TNC. Um, also want to give a big shout out to Jody Etheridge with the Williamson County SWCD. She's out there with John today, helping him run all of this stuff. So with that, live to you, John. Thanks, Lisa. Good morning, everybody. Uh, glad to have you here. I wish we were all together someplace eating a donut and drinking a cup of coffee, but that's not so easy in, in these times. But glad to have an opportunity to uh, talk to some folks again and have some uh, interaction because it's been a, a long, hard winter here in southern Illinois. Uh, we're located uh, just south of, of Marion, Illinois, which is about an hour south of I-64. We're about an hour and 20 minutes or so from, from Evansville, for those of you who might not uh, be logistically familiar with the area, but a lot of uh, similarity in the topography and the, and the soils and the challenges and uh, things that we uh, encounter here in, uh, with Southern Illinois agriculture as a lot of uh, the Southern part of, of Indiana. And uh, cover cropping is a big thing. Uh, it's, it's growing uh, every, every day, but probably not as much as it, it could uh, because of, uh, of some challenges that we're having some problems of dealing with. And this project that we're going to talk about today is a way to help get around some of those, uh, those issues that we uh, frequently see with uh, pairing a cover crop program ahead of corn. Uh, the uh, practice of planting cereal rye after uh, corn and then no-tilling beans into that has been something that has been a pretty standard cover crop practice and widely adopted across the large area of the Midwest for a long time. But um, as we transition the cover crops into, into the corn crop, that has uh, presented some problems with, uh, with that. In, in the management and the planning of that. And this project is helping to sidestep a, a little bit of, of that. So what we've got here behind me, uh, we can see the skips in the in the field and those aren't where uh, drill uh, rows have, have been plugged up and it, it was a mistake. We purposely done this. And what, what we've got is the strip is either left bare without a cover crop or in some cases we have uh, cover crop mixes that will winter terminate that will be uh, that will allow us to have a low residue environment to plant our corn into and uh, <clears throat> and get a better a better stand of that easier than what we would normally in a in a solid broadcast system in, in a lot of cases so we'll look at some of the ins and outs of that and what we've seen with this uh, this research project uh, through the years as we go. So if anybody's got any questions as we go, Lisa explained uh, how to get those those questions in. We'll have some time built into the middle of the program to specifically get into things a little bit deeper, but uh, Joe and others will be helping out to get some of those in. So if we do have questions, please, uh, please, <clears throat> please feel free. So what <clears throat> the way we manage this to get this cover crop established is that we've paired this cover crop system them with a lot of the ideas uh, surrounding the early planted, early maturing uh, bean varieties that is becoming more popular in the last few years, where we're planting beans early, 
uh, and we're, we're, we're able to get the bean harvest done early, and that allows a wider window to establish our, our cover crops. And that's one thing that is critical for success in planting a cover crop or making it easier uh, to, uh, to transition that, that, uh, that cover crop into a corn crop the following year. So we planted a, a relatively early bean, relatively early in the, in the season last year, harvested that uh, in the uh, last fall. Uh, our bean harvest here w was about the 10th or 12th of, um, of September. Uh, and those early early beans made about 55 bushels to the acre, so that was pretty good uh, pretty good yield for for this area. I feel like I left too much on the on the table with the bean variety selection, but what we did gain was the ability to have that wider window of uh, opportunity to get a cover crop established, uh, <clears throat> to have a better, a more diverse cover crop going in to the corn crop that we'll plant behind it this, this spring. So I think that's a big key. The wider the window that we have to establish the cover crop, the more options that we have, because if we think about a lot of the establishing corn in a cover crop, if we don't get bean harvested until late, let's say the end of October into, into November, uh, some of the only uh, good options that we have to really establish a cover crop that's going to make it through the winter is cereal rye. Cereal rye is a great uh, cover crop in the fact that it will control erosion and it can do a lot to build the soil, but the problems that we get into with uh, nitrogen and uh, some of the carbon nitrogen ratio uh, problems that, that tie up nitrogen and how that affects the corn crop that we plant into are, are critical. So what we've done here by having the wider window of uh, opportunity to get the cover crop growing, we've got a, a wider window to establish a more diverse cover crop. So what we've done here is that we've got uh, uh, hairy vetch and Crimson clover that is planted in the in these in these mixes. In some cases, uh, where the, in this uh, strip that I'm in here now, where the rows uh, kind of look uh, bare in between, those have left purposely blank. Other cases, we we planted uh, radish and uh, and oats into those uh, strips that will that are that are dying out and we'll plant into later on. So. That kind of gives an overview about what we're what we're thinking and how we get in how we get into this uh, frame of mind for this uh, cover crop uh, project, and we'll talk a little bit now about some of the background with that and some of the details with that. So, Jessica, if you could bring up the the slides, we'll show uh, show some pictures here. Okay, and in the in the first picture what we've got is a is a very nice field of, of hairy vetch uh, solid seeded uh, there are many producers uh, ac across the, the country that are have been in, involved in cover crops in a long time that they, they have developed management systems that work very well on their farm and in the process of doing that they have to figure out the equipment set up to do that that's very important and while that type of residue can be managed with modern planters that that we've got now it's it's not something that i would recommend some somebody just jump into right off of the bat because there are are many issues with those types of things that it's just a wide jump from going from a a, a conventional uh, cropping uh, mindset and whether you're no-till or, or conventional tillage to jump into something like that is is it just going to be a pretty steep learning curve so we've kind of worked that work with this project to look about some other things so next slide slide please and what what we've got here is that we've we initiated this uh, cover crop project uh, about six years ago now through a producer SARE grant with a farmer named Junior Upton that's in Hamilton County, just north of McLeansboro, just a little bit south of I-64. That had been a long time cover crop manager and very successful in some of his operations and what he had learned and been very, active in participating in research projects and different things with a lot of the extension educators and university folks uh, in southern Illinois through the years. So he came to me with this idea <clears throat> that uh, he, he thought that with the successes that he was seeing with cover crops in both yields and, and uh, the changes to his soils and the reduction in erosion, 
that he felt that if, if we could come up with a way to have cover crops in the system and be able to maximize the benefit from the heavy residue uh, and the, the heavy rooting and, and all of the other aspects that are positives from, for, to soil health, and, and also at the same time, sort of create an environment where <clears throat> the, there was an easy uh, way to establish a good, uh, a good crop or a stand of corn that um, in a low residue environment. So that kind of puts, it, puts us at odds there about, well, we want the heavy residue for all the benefits that we get to that. We want the good rooting for the soil health and all, all of those implications, but then how do we establish a corn crop into that? And that that's sort of been a, a roadblock, uh, whether it's mental or, or something to do with, with equipment in a, in a lot of cases. So we, we looked at uh, options to do this, and he came up with the idea to build a drill to be able to get the row alignment to where we had the ability to put a put the, a, a separate cover crop on the row, seven and a half inches off of the row on both sides, and then something in the, in the center of the row. So if we show the next slide, <clears throat> we'll look at the, at the uh, planter that, that he built. And this sort of looks like a Mad Max uh, idea. And Junior is a, is a very uh, accomplished machinist. And he put this thing together with bits and pieces uh, that uh, came from a junk pile basically and uh, put together a pretty Im impressive machine and while this looks pretty pretty primitive uh, you know we needed some type of planning system to have the right alignment to to do this because it, if in if you look at the alignment of a seven and a half inch drill, even though his planter was, that he made was seven and a half inch, it was it had a row on the center, and then we had seven and a half inches off of that. If you look at a basic seven and a half inch uh, spacing uh, regular wheat drill, that is the center is in between, so it's centered on there. So we're not we don't get just exactly the right alignment to do something like that. So he put together this planter with the alignment to where we had separate calibrations and things where we could put a cover crop on the row, seven and a half inches off of the row, something in, in, the, in the middle, so we could manage that residue more, more effectively. So <clears throat> moving forward, after we'd done this for, for a couple of years, next slide, please. Uh, we've, we started out with, the, uh, with working with Mike Plummer and some other extension folks that, that were involved er early on, and we wanted to have a uh, do this on a small plot uh, system to where we had randomization and things just like we would do like like I was when we were at the uh, the, the research farm with the U of I at, at Dixon Springs. We wanted to start this at from the basics and are in a randomized block plot to where we would have the the, the data that was applicable and comparable to other uh, other systems that were being looked at uh, you know in, in similar research environments. So we, we had is randomized block plot design. And after we'd done that for four or five years, uh, we've seen the benefits of, of this. And uh, the, the project was so interesting that even though the, the original SARE funding to, that, uh, that started this to help uh, pay for the, the building of the planter, uh, Junior and I continued to work on, on this just, uh, just on our own because we were seeing things that were, that were very interesting. And it was kind of a fun thing to, to look at, but we're to the point now where I think we see a lot of benefits in this. And I think if we can incorporate this in no-till environments uh, or with a strip-till system, there, there's some good opportunities here to work, especially when we think about the, uh, the acres of early planted beans and how that Im impacts the, the bean harvest potentially for a lot of producers uh, to help widen that window of, of application and to get a more diverse cover crop in there. That something like this will really help some folks get, get in, the, in the door. And I think it's something that can be done uh, pretty, pretty economically. We can look at other options to maybe, maybe uh, uh, not be as precise as what we have been with the uh, with the alignment and, and things like that. But I think there's a lot of, of, of options here. So moving on, uh, this last year, we planted, uh, we moved away from the small randomized uh, blocks and uh, we, we use a commercial drill. And one of the things that allowed us to, allowed this commercial drill to work is that our conservation district uh, 
purchased a uh, a land pride drill and it in in looking at 10 foot drills uh we got thinking about this that uh, it was an accident that we came upon this but uh, the the land pride drill happens to have the same alignment as what junior's uh planters did that that he built so it's not really it's a seven and three quarter or i'm sorry a nine and three quarter foot drill it's got an odd number of uh of uh, holes in it so it does have the center alignment so <clears throat> jessica if we show the next uh slide here i believe that will show how we we partitioned the boxes off like that so we we uh, we've got things lined up to where the cover crop that was going to be in the middle of the row on the row and to the side of the row were uh, partitioned off in that so that drill gave us the ability to uh, do what we had done with junior specialty uh, pro project and I think now that we can see that not everybody's going to want to do it with a with a 10 foot drill no no doubt but we have figured out a way that we can we can adapt this and make this work with uh, with a, a standard grain drill and and get pretty much the the same results here. So the next shot then will show us the picture of the uh, of the plot as it was planted. <clears throat> that shows the that's the last year that we uh, we planted the uh, randomized uh, block block plots. But we uh, <clears throat> that that shows the sort of the basic layout of the of the plot there. So with that, <clears throat> we'll kind of look at some of the uh, the changes that we're that we're seeing in in soils. And Jody, if you'd take the camera here, we'll walk over and we'll we'll look at some of the uh, changes to the soils and the impacts that that we're seeing. We're under a uh, a fog warning here in uh, Williamson County until 10 o'clock and the sun came up I think it's 707 here and it's still not very light so hopefully hopefully this will work so <clears throat> you know as we look at at some of the influences that we're seeing on the on the soils here and that you've all seen this as you've gone to cover crop meetings and looked out in some of your fields and different things but you know it's the rooting that we're getting and what we've got here we <clears throat> we've got some cereal rye, we've got some annual rye grass, we've got clover, a little bit of rapeseed that, that are in this. And this this cover crop, this was the rest of the field that was planted in, in a mix about about 10 days. Uh, this was planted about 10 days before. So we'll kind of look at some of the rooting differences here. So if we look at, at what we've got going, we can see those roots there and how that soil ju just crumbled and we, we've had uh, over four inches of rain here in the last three days so you know to, to think that you know that that soil even though it is, it is wet it's not really mud ball wet there there's still some break and crumble to that and as i was out here pulling samples yesterday uh you know it was just amazing that you could walk through the yard and the top inch was just it was just slime but when you got out into the field with the better water infiltration and and the improved soil characteristics about how this how this works so you know we can see those live roots moving down into that and i just pulled i just dug these up this morning so you know just a lot of good things going going on right there so these are the these benefits or the this type this type of action we've got a got a worm and I on the warm day here about a week ago I came out and I got a shovel like this and I, there was enough worms in there I could have fished all day so that was pretty <clears throat> that was pretty good so you know these these are uh, demonstrations and observations that you'll see in any cover crop field but <clears throat> as as we advance in towards planting season about how to convert this into a, a corn crop as, we, as I've said before, is sometimes a little bit of a of a challenge, especially for people that are first getting getting into this. So, as we look to this a little bit later, cover crop, we can see this was about 50 feet apart in the in the field, but you know you can see that there's more. Look at the how how much bigger the roots are in this sample than than what we're seeing here. Okay. I'll kind of look 
look in there. You can kind of look at that mass and you can see some rooting going on in there, but then look at this sample and see how the roots are bigger. This is, t this is 10 days different planting in the, in the fall. So <clears throat> all of those, the more of that rooting that we can get, the better off we're gonna be. And you can just see that, you know, even though this is a little bit lighter from just being different in the field, We've got all of the, the worms and kind of doing, <clears throat> doing their things, but it's really easy <clears throat> to see these differences just in the top little bit about what you can get with a shovel. But what we're after with these cover crop programs, especially in, in our part of the, of the world here, is what we're changing below where that shovel is, is going to go, okay? because this is, a nice, this is a nice clump of soil here, but we're gonna want roots down below that to get through the summers. And a lot of our area in this field is, uh, is a fragipan soil. So we've got severe uh, root and uh, water limiting factors that we have to confront every, every year. So <clears throat> Jody, if we come over here, we can see some, some soil cores that, that we took and we can kind of pan over here and see the the soil probe that we've got on the on the tractor here, maybe there we go. Okay, so what we've what we've got there is a is a soil probe on on the back, and we can take a, a four foot probe with this <clears throat> with this, uh, so we can see what's going on down deeper than than what we can dig up with a shovel, and I think that's very important. If you're involved in any type of cover crop management, uh, whether it's on your farm or you're a consultant that's working with farmers that, that are in cover crop management systems, that it's important to look at what's going on down deeper. And if we can get access to one of these, I know that the uh, 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 NRCS folks, some of them have, uh, there's access to those, there's some different cores that, that we can get that aren't necessarily this big, but I think it's important that we look below what the shovel or any of our, our tillage would get to. So this is what we end up with here. If we kind of look and break these up, John, for the, these, I'm yes. getting just a little bit of chop on my end. So if you could slow down maybe like 20%, I think that would help the. Hey, I'll my, do that. My bandwidth keep up just a little bit, maybe. Hopefully, hopefully that I'll, helps everybody. I I will do that. Thank you. Okay. So what what we're what we're dealing with here, <clears throat> we've got samples that were from the field right behind us, and then these these two cores on the back came out of a of a pasture that has never had a crop grown on it. It's been a fescue pasture for the whole for the whole time, and if we can look at some of the differences that that we see here, and we see that okay, the pasture we've got some dark soils up here, and we can see that it comes down, and we take our knife, and we kind of poke around there. We kind of come down here to a point that whoop, look at there. That there's some resistance right there, and you can see the difference. See that mo that modeling of the gray that comes up to here, and then there's a, a difference from about here on up. As we come down and just look at how your knife sticks into that, boom! Right right there is the is the fragipan of the soil. Okay, so if we look about what's going on here, we've got. The same situation of the soil that we're, we had the shovel full just a minute ago. And we've got some roots that are going down. And there we get to this hard part. And we've got a few roots that are coming there. We've got a few more. We had some good fescue in there. <clears throat> but as we get down here all the way to the bottom, you can see what, what we've got there is just soil. There's no roots. Let's see, there isn't anything there. It's pretty hard stuff. You can see how that there's just no 
no movement of water or any rooting or any anything there. So let's compare that then to the soil cores that we're seeing in the in the cover crop field. And this is not a super long term uh, cover crop field. This is on year eight of the cover crop program and pro the first two uh, I would say was pretty moderate with just some cereal rye because I've learned on, on our farming operation just like everybody else has to do. And I was concerned with managing high residue and how my equipment would work with that and, and being able to terminate it and those, ty those types of things. So this has been a what I would consider a pretty customary learning curve on and how the, the soil transition was. So, you know, if we look at the at the cover crop field here, you know, as we first off look at the whole at the whole core, and you can see a lot of difference here. The move back here are you know, we're only dealing with about that much, the top eight, eight or nine inches or so of where the where the main rooting system of that plant is. And then we get out into this hard this hard pan area and there's just nothing going on down here. But as we get into the cover crop field, we look at that and if we do the same same thing, kind of take our knife and just bounce it along that. Yeah, there's some when we get down to here, we can feel some, some resistance, but it's a different type. And notice the differences in color. We've got these grays and browns that are in here. There's not much mixing, but all of this is more of a uniform color. And still, as we move down, yeah, there's some resistance, but you know, it, it's a totally different soil profile that we're looking at. And th these were taken within 100 feet apart. Same, same soil type, everything but they are not the same soil characteristics. And I think that's important to point out that we're actually making changes. We're just not dealing with the soil that God gave us to grow things on. We're actually making this better. And in this example here, if we kind of start digging off, you know, the bottom end of it here, and what do we got? Probably 30, 34 or 36 inches. Look at there, right on the, on the bottom, there's a root coming out of the bottom of that there was no root coming out of the bottom of, of this one. If we break these off, there again, just a little, little bit, we can pick those things out. Is that showing up okay? Is it right at the end of the knife here? You kind of see that hair root is breaking off. There's a good one. So this, I think this this sort of helps show the difference here in in how we can make soils better. Uh, I know that th this hill has had a hard life. Um, it was grown. Uh, we we have a, a goose and duck hunting club on this farm. So back in the 70s, and 80s, early, early 90s. When, when the goose hunting was very good, close to Crab Orchard uh, Lake and the, and the Federal Refuge here, there was a, a lot of this ground was corn on corn for many, many years. Uh, and then we went and it's been beans on beans. So it's not, it's not been the most uh, friendly management system that we've had because we've had other things that, that we were doing. But I, I can't believe how, how the soils have changed in just eight years of this cover crop system here. And we're seeing differences in our, in our corn yields too. Uh, ground, this ground that uh, <clears throat> years ago, if, if the hills made 120, 130, 40 bushel, that, that's fine. Uh, year before last, uh, in, in a summer that turned off fairly dry, we ended up with 180 bushel corn on, on this field. And there's been other advancements to, to the, that have gone on in the same time. And, but I know that we've put together a system here that, that is, is, is working. So, you know, I think that it's important that if you need to get a backhoe out in a field or find some way to dig down and find out what, we're, what is going on below the, the surface that you can get with a shovel, that is a, that is a good thing. Another important thing to, to think about in the, in the idea of uh, where are we going with tillage versus no-till and all these cover crop systems is that the problems that we've identified at this layer here where the fragipan is in our, in our soils, 
know, we're, we're down 15, 16, 17 inches. We're not going to do anything to this soil from here down with the tillage tool for, with, with any economics in, involved in that. And, but at the same time, we have worked with a cover crop system within, within seven or eight years that's got rooting depth down to 40 and, 40 and 50 inches in, in this soil. So I think that's something that's uh, very important to, uh, to think about. So with that, we'll move on a little bit. Uh, Joe, is there any questions or anything that we need to cover? We don't have any questions yet, but I did uh, search for your SARE report from the initial start of this study. And I dropped that link into the chat for everybody if they want to see the original SARE article and report for how everybody started out. And um, if you guys have any questions, whether it's something John covered and you missed it, or whether it's something he hasn't yet and you want to hear about it, please do feel free to drop, drop that right into the Q&A or into the chat, and we'll go ahead and ask it. Next, we've got, uh, we've got a few more slides to go through that'll kind of show you uh, some of some more of the progression of the uh, of the field here. So <clears throat> what we're what we're seeing here is in the our our check or our control for this for this project was no-till soybeans. So we've done this e each year where we've had the uh, the different planting uh, alignment of the cover crops in relation to the row. Uh, we've had the winter terminated uh, cover crops that were on the row. Some of the treatments uh, just had that had that uh, uh, portion left blank. <coughs> Excuse me. And for our our check, we have compared this against uh, just regular uh, no till into into soybean stubbles. So we we've done this in in two different ways. Uh, as far as, as as management, we normally when when we put together a project, the whole plot would be managed uh, as as one. The only thing that we've done different here is is that I made sure to manage the uh, the the control or the the regular no-till cover crop as if we would if it was in that field. So <clears throat> this was an extra a strip along the, the side that we left just to have an example of how the winter annual weeds uh, competition is, is uh, impacted by the cover crop. So here we can see mare's tail. We've got the <clears throat> normal uh, henbit and chickweed and things like that. Uh, off to the side to the left, you can see the, uh, the annual ryegrass that we've left to go. But, uh, you know, so this is the kind of... Uh, weed pressure that, that we're dealing with. But in the project, to make it fair, we managed the, the straight no-till, no cover crop system like we would have if it was the whole field of that. And then on the other treatments, we managed those treatments for late termination of, <clears throat> and to get all of the cover crop benefits that, that we could. So in, in that respect, we have not given the cover crop any real advantage because we have pushed it to the limits as far as late termination and uh, the, uh, the late planting and, and everything that was involved in, in that. So next, John, look at the next, yeah, go ahead. You've got everybody stirred up here now. Um, and we've got a couple of questions that roll in. I think this is probably where you're headed, um, but before we get too far off, um, we've got a couple of questions on the on those cores. So, um, what species are penetrating the fragipan? And um, similar question, but maybe a little bit different. What cover crop was used to get roots down that far? I think you had referenced on that last core. You had roots down okay. thirty six inches or so. Yeah, with the deep uh, with the deep rooting cover crops. That the thing that has made the made the difference is annual ryegrass, and, and annual ryegrass. And it, it's interesting that uh, many many people are probably familiar with the work of Lloyd Murdoch at the University of, of Kentucky. He's done tremendous uh, research with uh, annual ryegrass, and and figuring out what is in play that uh, that allows annual ryegrass to penetrate the fragipan and. And annual ryegrass is, is about our only 
really good option that we've got to be able to do that. And what, it, what it's in play is the root exudate of the growing annual ryegrass root will help to break up the chemical bonding that forms the, the fragipan. So uh, that's, that's what we're dealing with here. And his, uh, Lloyd's uh, research was, was really sparked by uh, research that Mike Plummer had started with, on the Junior Upton farm, uh, just uh, you know, within a quarter mile of where I'm showing these plot flip pictures. So Mike was looking at uh, introducing cover crops into no-till systems through Southern Illinois and got onto annual ryegrass. And they, they found that the annual ryegrass was, uh, was penetrating that, uh, that fragipan layer and uh, that was making the big difference. So what we've got is, is that we've got the annual ryegrass roots that will penetrate that. And then in the subsequent years, the uh, other cover crops that are planted after that and the corn roots especially will follow those root channels and, and kind of perpetuate the, the system and get down there to take advantage of minerals and, and uh, water especially that is available uh, deeper down. So that, Annual ryegrass is the is the key to uh, the fragipan management in in this uh, in the on these fragipan soils for sure, and it you know the and the thing of it is if if it's able to impact the fragipan soils like that it ju you just get more of the same if you're not in a fragipan system so that's that's what we're dealing with there. I think as a follow up to that, John, do you? would you expect roots down that far if you did not have the fragic soils? Would we expect roots right. if we did not have the fragipan soils? Yeah, so if you had, you know, if you're blessed with silt down 80 feet or whatever they have over there in Southwest Indiana, um, <laughs> even though that cover crop is still relatively small this time of year, what kind of rooting do you expect on it? I there. The root, there would be no reason why the rooting wouldn't be as a, as aggressive if it was in a non-fragipan soil. So they, that you would expect that the cover crop would get down at least as deep as what the what your corn your corn roots were in in those types of, of environments. But I think the thing too is that with the annual ryegrass and, and really if you're, if we're not dealing in a uh, in a uh, fragipan soil, just the fact that the cover crop is there growing through the the winter and especially with spring green up, as the soil is, is moist or you know wet as it is now in a, in a lot of places, with the, with those roots growing in that that's that's helping to add melanus to the soil and break up some some slight compaction. And uh, and make it easier for the for the corn, corn roots to compete, you know, once they they come out of the bag. So I think it's just a it's a winning situation from from both sides of the coin. Do you think back to your fragile pans? Do you think that those annual ryegrass roots are moving around the edges of the prisms, or do you think they're actually able to go through the prisms? They're in in my experience here. They're going they're going through. Now I I I know that the I'm not a soil scientist, but I've worked around a lot of a lot of fields in southern Illinois, and I've been down in Kentucky and seen there. And I think in, in Kentucky, they're they're dealing with a little bit probably a harder fragipan, or there's differences, and especially if you get over there on the other side of Kentucky Lake in those red clays and things. Uh, they're it's not exactly like what we're seeing here, but it, it's definitely growing through it. And that's, that's what Dr. Murdoch has found in, in his research. And he's done work to iso try to isolate the, uh, the actual compounds in the exudates that are, that are helping to, uh, to do this. So it's pretty amazing what we're getting to, what we're seeing with this and, and, and having annual ryegrass in these, in these mixes. And, you know, there again, there <clears throat> with, it seems like anything that is, is a help, there's also uh, some different uh, management systems. And it, it's not like being, uh, it's not unlike buying a new corn planter. When you buy a new corn planter, 
it's got the ability to do a lot of things, but you have to set that for each field and each environment that, that you go to. So adjustments need to be made. And with annual ryegrass, uh, I, it's, it's commonly uh, referred to that, that uh, you know, there, there are different, and I will call them challenges, but I, I'd say that they're management considerations in how you deal with that, with that species. So termination can, is, is different. We need to we need to observe more of our common sense uh, sp uh, spray tactics to do this because when you've got a plant like annual ryegrass that isn't too uh, big and uh, ominous from the top side, it has a tremendous rooting capacity. So if we're dealing with something that we're going to control, especially with glyphosate where we've got a limited amount of top growth and we've got a tremendous amount of rooting that where we need to translocate that, that herbicide within that plant, uh, we need to uh, have a management strategy to be able to do that. And managing annual ryegrass from a termination standpoint is different than many of our other cover crops. But as long as we're, we're spraying when it's a little bit warmer, we're treating our water to make sure that we've got the, our, our water uh, solution to where it doesn't tie up any of the glyphosate. So we're getting 100% of that into the plant and we're using full rates of, you know, glyphosate can uh, uh, control annual ryegrass very, very effectively. And uh, I've, I've tried to, make mistakes with it and you sure can but as long as you've got a a, a plan going into the uh, to the issue you know it's not anything that is uh, that can't be dealt with pretty effectively and another thing if we've got a, a cover crop that is that has the ability to provide those types of benefits uh, I think it's uh, in our interest to figure out how to manage that effectively to get those those benefits so I hope that helped to cover that. Yeah, it did. Thank you very much. Um, we have a couple others here, but I think they're probably more along the lines of where you're headed. So um, we can probably go back on track. One, uh, one's about wanting to know about your planter setup, and one's um, wanting to know some of the differences you see with precision cover crops versus random covers. So better stand, better yields, et cetera. Um, hey, what do you see with that? Have... So. Yeah, I think we'll. I think we'll. We might hit on that as as we go, <clears throat> but if That's not, uh, bring bring me back in uh, late, later on, and we'll we'll do that. But in the in the last uh, in the last slide that that we looked at, <clears throat> where we showed the the winter annual competition in the uh, where the uh, non cover crop treatments with or our control. Now we now we. There we go. So that's what we were dealing with, you know, if if we wouldn't have had any early burn down with that. And then the next slide, it will it shows that <clears throat> the clean row environment there where we're planning into. And you can see that we've allowed the, the annual ryegrass cereal rye mix with hairy vetch in this case to grow on either side of the row. But then we've got a relatively clean uh, space in, in between this. And I think hairy vetch is, is another one too that uh, as far as cover crops go, it can provide a lot of benefits. It, it has the ability to uh, supply a lot of nitrogen for the corn. It, the rooting uh, characteristics of, of hairy vetch really add a lot of tilt to the soil, give a lot of good mellowness to it. It's not a deep rooting cover crop like, like annual ryegrass is, <clears throat> but it does a lot of good in a, in a mix, but it can provide uh, present us with some problems as far as wrapping and uh, just management issues about how to plant into that effectively uh, as we uh, as we work into that. So what we found that's kind of, kind of fell into this is that with the with the row of annual ryegrass and cereal rye in the middle of the of the uh, corn row, that kind of works as a trellis system. So it's helped to take some of the direction of the growth of the hairy vetch into the middles of the row and we're planting into it with without the wrapping problems here but you know in this this picture we're just looking at the weed free row so even though we don't have any cover crops in that particular uh, row zone right there just the uh, the competition from the cover crop seven and a half inches away on each side of that row has, has helped out a, a lot so we'll look at the next move on to the next now 
Okay, this shows our uh, where we have the winter termination, uh, uh, terminated cover crops here. We show the radish and there's some oats in, in there too. Uh, on the on the left, that's the fall picture. And then on the on the right, you can see where that uh, winter termination has taken place. And we've got that clean row down into the uh, middle of the of the crimson clover there. And crimson clover is another uh, cover crop as far as uh, nitrogen uh, additive to the to the soil and and helps with a lot of things. And besides that, it makes a pretty uh, uh, pretty picture. So we 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 lucked into that. So okay, we'll move on to the next, please. Yeah, and this <clears throat> this just shows the a better picture of what our what our plant as we're getting closer to planting. And you can see in in this case our cereal rye. Uh, in the in the centers of the row, and there is annual ryegrass planted in the in the centers too. Uh, kind of adds some you know some row structure to there, and uh, it's worked out good for our plot planting because I don't have to worry about any guidance because I've got those nice rows that I put a put a wheel on and one right in the center of the tractor, and then the the planter runs runs right down through that. So the next slide will show us conditions that we planted in into and again that this is probably a little bit later than than what we would plant into in in a lot of cases but we have we have purposely tried to uh, uh, put the cover crop to the test in every case in in this case so uh, nobody could say yeah but so I think that you know we put the cover crop to every disadvantage that we can in this in this case to try to help to prove the system and then we've also managed the other side uh, like it would be in our in our controls. Okay, in the next couple slides, we'll show the, the hairy vetch plots. And this is sort of an early one here. And you can see even though the hairy vetch is probably knee high uh, in the in this this situation, that that row, the clean row is down in there, and that kind of shows how that trellised up there. So I think that was something that was that uh, we just kind of lucked onto, and that's really worked out to our 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 advantage because we've got some sunlight down there. The uh, it warms up. It's not just like you're planting into a mat of of vetch, but we're still getting the advantages out of that. Okay, as we move on, we'll we'll look at the that's how it was when we planted. So the vetch has come up, it's in full bloom and it's taken down those middles. But <clears throat> as we as we plant through that, uh, they they those rows have just opened up and the planter units run right through there just, just pretty easily. So we'll move on to the next one. And that just shows a and more of an aerial or an upward uh, picture of that to show how the the row units uh, opened up those uh, those rows and we'll move on this is another <clears throat> another picture about how the the winter kill has uh, has helped that and <coughs> excuse me I think too, and, and we've seen some uh, some advantages from the uh, the termination in there. What we uh, lucked on to here is as we planted the cover crop specifically on the row, in calibrating the planter that Junior built first the first year, we got the uh, we got the radishes at, at just a little bit thick, and uh, that that worked nice because we had a lot of smaller tubers rather than the than the big uh, holes to plant into for for an early planting like we might uh, might see in some cases so we'll move on please and this this shows after the after the planter has gone through and it's just a great planting in, environment and <clears throat> what what we have found is is that the the cover crops especially if we're in a, a a wet spring that having the cover crop planted on each side of that row will help dry out that that row environment a little bit so we we've been able to plant this cover crop plot in wetter conditions when we wouldn't have been out in a in a fully broadcasted uh, solid seeded in, environment uh, in the in the same uh, neighborhood so we can move on, and this this shows the 
there you can see a seed if you kind of squint down there to the right of the uh, uh, where that hole is is dug but you notice we're we're planting you know we're taking advantage of that thick cover crop mat at the top of the picture that is a challenge to plant into and and then we're planting into just regular soybean stubble pretty much in the in the row unit and and a, the nice thing about this is is that really about any planter could plant into this system uh, most of our modern planters that that uh, that are coming out, you know, we've got uh, down pressure, we've got tremendous technology as far as seed drop and depth control and those types of things. And when you're planting into this clean row and environment, uh, <clears throat> you most of our planters are going to have the ability to do this. I'm planting into into this with an older uh, Kinsey style uh, Almaco uh, plot planter. It's a four row system. It's not a heavy heavy planter. And it does just a great job of getting down uh, in there. So we'll move move on. Okay. And I think if I, yeah, we'll look at this. This shows the uh, the corn that that we end up with, and I think that pretty good looking corn there. Uh, and you can see the the heavy uh, mat of residue down down the center of that row and another thing is is that we're not uh, not really using uh, heavy rates of residual uh, herbicides on this either that that row mat is is pretty much holding on that uh, we uh, when we terminated uh, after planting or right at right at planting uh, th this is this is what we what we end up with so the next picture will show at harvest and how that held. So that turned out <clears throat> fairly good there. So we'll move on. I think at that point, we've got time for some more questions, Joe, if there is any, and then we'll. We didn't have any new ones come in, but maybe if you want to recap a little bit. Um, so as far as explaining your planter setup you said you you just have a, a kinsey style plot planter yeah that's what we're that's what we're using to plant that's what we're using to plant this with uh it's nothing uh nothing special i mean we're uh i don't have any of the any airbags or anything on this this planter that i'm i've been planting this this plot with uh it's it would be the, the typical Kinsey 2000 row units, which would be about a, a John Deere 7000 uh, system. Uh, I do have a colder on the front of it. I'm not sure that that would be uh, be necessary, and I'm thinking about taking that off. So I think one of the one of the nice things about this type of, of system is is that the most of our farmers have the uh, the auto steer and the, a lot of the precision planting technologies to allow the cover crop to be planted like this. And as long as we get the cover crop planted like this, uh, we have, uh, it, it's just like planting in, into a, a, a no-till soybean system with no, with no cover crop. So <clears throat> I think from that standpoint that this is a good entry level way that we can kind of help to mitigate some of the risk that are commonly associated with going into a no-till system, especially where that those first couple corn years are, are uh, concerned. And we can kind of work, work through this pretty, pretty, pretty effectively. When, when are you terminating that cover crop? What's we're, your timing been, look like? We've been, We've been we've been terminating this at the the couple slides back where I showed that it was the later planting. So we've been we've been planting this purposely a little bit later, and we're terminating at the time of, of planting or just just directly after that. And the, and again, the, it could be handled a little bit different than that de depending, uh, but. We, we've tried to do this to where we weren't giving any unfair advantage to the cover crop system. So we're pushing it all to the limit. Uh, one of the things that I'm gonna try uh, here, the, these, these, this plot that, that we're in now is a little bit over 600 feet long. 
uh, and we we didn't get our another location planted this year. So to make two out of this, I'm going to um, try something that we haven't done done before, and I'm going to spray a, a grass herbicide over the back half of this to take out the grasses and let the uh, the vetch and the clover grow alone and see how that compares to having the, the grasses in all the way to, to termination. So, you know, those are things that, that might be can be considered, but, you know, I think that it's, a, this opens up some options to do a, to do a lot of things with a lot of, uh, with not a lot of uh, other management involved. And I've got a picture of later on and we'll, and we'll keep moving, but I think too that, uh, as we've looked at this with the, we've kept the species segregated from the rows and we've get, you know, we've done a lot of specialty things here in this research project that I'm, I'm not so sure that we need to do in the, when we take this to the field. I think that, for example, that we could probably take one, one mix and plant it in the, in the rows between the, in our cover crop rows and, uh, and get along just fine in, in most cases too, where we have segregated and we've had the clovers and the vetches alone that end up just right next to the, to the row. Uh, another thing with the, with the drill, because there are more, uh, more of our larger seed carts and, and larger uh, grain drills that are set up on seven and a half inch spacing that don't have this particular alignment. And we've got a picture of this later on, but we can actually just plant, have two cover crop rows in between our, our corn, maybe plant the, a little bit higher population in that to do a better job of controlling erosion. So that would, uh, that would be another option too. It also gives us a wider uh, row window to plant into. So if we're on a little bit of, high, of, of uh, rolling ground or something, and we've got some planter sway as we go up and down the, the hills that we'll still manage to stay in on that, uh, on that row zone uh, pretty, pretty well. Sure. Um, we've got a couple of requests to put the yield data back up on the screen. Um, sure. And I think we have a slide there. We are already at our hour. That went extremely fast. I did not realize it was that it was 930 already. Well, 930 here. But I think, I think we can we've roll... still got a little bit of time if you want to stick yeah, around with us, can... John. So, yeah, I think we can roll through some of these real yield results uh, just really, really quick, and then we can get into into things. I'm sorry I've not moved moved along good, but I, you know we've got a lot of a lot of stuff to to talk about, and I would welcome you know to uh, people contact me after this uh, gets done. I'd be be glad to answer. Uh, questions through you guys or or emails directly to me or phone calls or whatever it takes. But this uh, the next couple of slides we have here shows some of the yield results that that we've had. And uh, this the, I think the big thing to point out here is is that you can see the treatment number one there, the yield of of the check. In every case that we've we've had this over the the years of of the study. Any type of mix or the the alignment of our uh, cover crops has been uh, superior to just the no-till uh, soybean uh, stubble uh, control by by several bushels, and we've seen as much as 30 bushel in in some of this. And I wouldn't say that this is a, a guaranteed for every 30 bushel, or, you know, for a 30 bushel increase. But I think we have shown that with proper management, that this this system can be as good or better than anything and allow us to get some of these longer term benefits to our cover crops that have kind of been elusive in our in our corn years. So that's 18. If we move on to the next slide, please, that just shows the next slide. And you can see with the exception of a couple of plots that we had some deer damage in, uh, it was the same same scenario there that with the cover crop uh, in, the, in these uh, various alignments, and we've looked at some different species through the years too, our, our yields are, are better. And so go, go ahead, we can just click through, click through these. And this shows a, a, a summary of what we're doing. And it looks at, at the average of the, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> an average of the chicks, uh, the crimson clover treatment versus the hairy vetch. Uh, and then on the right hand side, we've got some a look at the averages of the winter, winter terminated cover crops over just a, a clean row, a little bit advantage to the to the clean row and then where we put crimson clover on the row. 
So we can go to the next slide, please. And this shows just what, what we're getting at the Upton Farm is the differences in our soil health. This is the basically the same type of soil type there in Hamilton County that what we're dealing with 70 or 80 miles away on, on my farm here. And we see that the lighter colored soil to the bottom, but we've got that good dark uh, topsoil that was developed. And that darker layer of the topsoil is not something that would be inherent to that uh, soil type if it wasn't in a, in a cover crop uh, system. So we'll see what's next there. Yeah, and this, this is another picture. There was a, another um, fellow that, that uh, was nearby that had a, a 40 foot seed cart and he, he aligned, he adjusted his RTK system to where he could get the three cover crop rows in between the, the rows and, did, and split a field like that and, and saw a 15 bushel uh, difference in the in the cover crop and you think well gosh why why would that be well had some dry dry weather later in the season and that that cover crop in there has just helped to conserve moisture we pro probably got better water infiltration all the way around so we'll we'll move on and this is just another picture where strip till was incorporated with that and i think this is this opens up some options too with the strip tilling as far as how th this system can work better as we move north, especially in, in Illinois, as we move into our darker soils that are that are better drained, uh, you know, that where we can consistently get in and have an early, uh, you know, to mid-April corn planting. Some of the things that we see it as advantages later in the year, like moisture conservation and cooler soil temperatures, those are disadvantages to early planting. But if we can pair this in those systems with the with strip till uh, and and still keep our, our cover crops in between. I think the cover crop in a lot of cases could help to, to dry those strips out and, and make a better environment to plant into than, uh, than without and, and help to get more cover crop acres uh, in, involved because, you know, as, especially when we get into the tile drained areas and the uh, issues with nitrate losses and those types of things, it's important that we look to, to more adoption of cover crops in those areas because cover crops are something that can, can help that, uh, that quite a bit. So, yeah, and this, and I think we can probably stop here. This, this shows a, a farmer down in, in Kentucky that I've, I've met up with that he's doing the, basically the same thing, but they're using uh, just cereal rye so that and and they're using 40 foot uh, seed carts they drill their cereal rye and then they follow that with a, uh, a, a strip till bar with our with RTK so their strips are tilled for the spring and and having good results with that and and I you know you'd think that well Kentucky's farther south they should have a wider window to plant uh, and and get more diverse cover crops and and things like that with that we've talked about well there's a lot of the acres in in uh in kentucky your soybean acres especially that are double crop that are planted behind wheat so with their harvest date of uh, of soybeans and how they need to manage that going into corn this has been something that has been uh been working well uh, uh, for them, and they're doing it on a, on a lot of acres. And in the conversation with him, you know, that's something that they're not going to going to move away from any anytime soon. So with that, I think we can take some questions. Uh, we've covered a lot of ground, and I'm sorry it's taken a little bit uh, bit extra, but <clears throat> we'll. We'll move on, Joe. If there's any more questions or anybody else has any, I I would. Uh, be glad would you to have stick some around. more? Would you have some more come in? And and just as a reminder for everybody, if you do have to take off, we are recording this and we'll get this posted to our YouTube channel, and all the registrants will get a a link once we get that up. So, um, but otherwise, stick around if you can, please. And um, so, John, I saw you've you've talked about that being a hunting club, and you've talked about geese which are grazers and you had some deer damage on one of your uh i think it was one of your yield layouts there but other than those grazers um do you have any other animals there on the farm have you ever tried to terminate a cover crop with grazing 
I don't have any here on on my farm. Uh, I, I have a friend and a, a, a cooperator that's in the metropolis, Illinois, that's just right across the river from Paducah, Kentucky, and they they plant a lot of acres of annual ryegrass uh, cover crop, and they graze it pretty much from establishment until the time that they, they, they're getting ready to take them off now so they can get a little bit of growth on it to plant, but they're having tremendous luck with this. And they're also also seeing tremendous benefits to their soil because the more as as the as the cattle graze that off, it just seems like as they keep that that cover crop clipped off, the cover crop keeps uh, expanding the the root system, and it puts a lot of its if its efforts into the to the root growth to regrow. And uh, I think it just paired with the uh, uh, grazing systems would have a good. Uh, a good fit for sure. In fact, I I know it does, and they're they're not seeing any damage from their ground or anything. And he show, he sent me a picture yesterday. They've had four and a half inches of rain plus down there over the last three or four days, and he's got cows that are happily grazing out in the in the field, and they're not mudding it up or or anything. So I think that's a good thing to look to. Sure. Yes. And there's absolutely, I mean, just like you showed those roots going deep, there's value in having those roots in that soil to help help hold it up in a lot of adverse conditions. Um, Jessica, we have a request here to show the the plot diagrams. Can you pull that slide up and have that up for a little bit? And then um, John, there I'd like to- There is no diagram with, um, with plots, sorry. Okay, great. Um, I was thinking we showed one maybe oh. really early. Well, let but, me go uh, back and look. <laughs> I don't know. I, th I showed the, there was a slide that showed the randomization of the, of the plots after it was planted, but there was no diagram there. And then the only other thing I think was probably the, uh, the way that the uh, treatments were broken out on those yield uh, slides. I think the question came in before we had shown the yields, but um, if we still have that person with us and can get a little clarification on what you'd like there, that would be great. Um, meanwhile, John, it would be, I think it's, I, I think most importantly, we should have a little bit of a discussion on planting rates. So are you figuring your planting rates in pounds per acre? And how do you go about doing that when it's sort of per row um it's, mm -hmm. it's i assume it's a lot more in the drill setup but you have to compromise so so how do you go about calculating out your seeding rates and what are your seeding rates it you're 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 right there there's a little bit of compromising that go that goes on but what the way i did this is that i i calibrated the drill for the the uh heavy rate of seeding that was going on in the row centers so with the with the annual ryegrass cereal rye and the legume mix i was calibrating that and i'm looking for the seeding rate in that in that row would be about 60 pounds of, of cereal rye 10 pounds of annual ryegrass and uh, i believe we're at eight pounds of vetch and 10 pounds of clover in the on the on both sides of that so it was pretty pretty heavy uh rate but i calibrated for that and then on the rows where the legume was on on each side of that i actually mixed oats in with the with the legume in in this setting and the oats was our extender to make that come out right it the way the the, the drill was set and then the oats have uh, winter killed. And in this, in this situation, my oats haven't winter killed just exactly, uh, just exactly right. But in, in other years, it has, it's worked out to where they, they just left the, the clover and the, and the vetch out there. So, and again, I, you know, we've, we've looked at this as the precision right, right down to the end as far as our row alignment. And, and I think that especially if we're just planting two rows of cover crops with a, with a regular seven and a half inch drill at normal uh, uh, row settings and, and those types of things that 
uh, you know, we could have two rows of the mix or even three rows in, in between. And uh, I don't know that I'm, I'm sold on the, on the absolute necessity of having that segregation being so much, but we've kept our treatments in, in a line so we can kind of follow our, our yield data and have, have something to work with as we, as we build on our, our data set. Great, thanks. Um, so it looks like they, we would like the chart on what was in the row and on the row. That that one that we, I think that was one we showed early on. Okay, I'll get that pulled up. Yeah, what was when we had when we had treatments that what we were planting on the row was the winter terminated treatments. And again, we had some where we didn't, we just left no cover crop in there, but the winter terminated uh, species were an oat radish mix. And then all, what we had off of the row was just straight in the pictures that, that were shown were just uh, either hairy vetch or crimson clover. And then in the center of the of the row, we had whatever legume was in the treatment, with the addition of uh, annual ryegrass and cereal rye. And then our, our yield charts that I'm I'm seeing over here, <clears throat> there were some there were some different uh, mixes of treatments that we had, uh, looking at different species. There was some kale and Ethiopian cabbage and a whole bunch of other things that. Uh, that we threw in that either some seed companies had were had an interest in in an evaluation or we were interested in in getting a look at those things but the the mixes with the with hairy vetch and crimson clover have kind of been our our common threads and and our go-to treatments through the the time so what we've got in the in the trial at at this point is that um, the crimson clover and the and the hairy vetch mixes and with or without the uh, winter terminated cover crops on the on the row and that would be compared against the no the no cover crop just regular soybean stubble no-till great thank you john i think just a quick recap on on some of those differences you saw, some of some of the advantages you saw in having the precision cover crops versus a random stand or or a no-till. So, you know, you saw differences in weed pressure, right? You saw yield differences. Um, can you just give us a quick rundown on some of those again? As as far as the big the biggest differences, I think that. You know, the, we saw the weed control. Any any time we're we're dealing with a cover crop in a in a field in in any in any system, we're going to see some impact on our weed control. So we're in the cover crop plots uh, or the cover crop treatments, uh, we saw good suppression in in every case from winter annuals. So uh, mare's tail, uh, henbit, chickweed have not been a problem in this particular field in, in this year. I do have some henbit coming up. But uh, there's nowhere out in, in here have I found any mare's tail of, at, at all. And th this field without cover crops it was, a, was a mare's tail nightmare. Uh, so, you know, we're seeing weed suppression from the winter annual standpoint. And then as we plant through this, the residue mat helps suppress weeds through the, through the summer and the corn growing season. So that, that's been a, a benefit. So we're not fighting a lot of the uh, the issues that we see in regular clean clean till conventional fields, and uh, just just overall, I think that the uh, the ease or the stand of corn that we're getting in in this uh, this environment, especially the couple of years that that we've been doing this, where we've had we've been confronted with wet springs, uh, we've been able to get in and and plant these plots very successfully. And that we're seeing good uh, planting environment within that row zone, and we're also seeing the support that we're getting from that residue mat that we're able to drive a tractor through the field on top of that cover crop, 
and with that root mass that kind of helps hold, hold things up so we're not uh, we're not um, creating a lot of compaction or anything else like we would have been if we would have been working in a conventional environment on the same planting days that we were planting this plot. And you don't have a full width cover crop there to compare all that to, is that correct? I, we, we don't now, but because we've been looking at the, uh, the precision planted uh, things, but we have had uh, solid seeded cover crops in in that and we've in in our case and i think that the 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 advantage that i'm seeing in in solid seeded cover crops is probably that my small plot planter isn't set up to do that really effectively but in with a plot plant with a planter that's not got all the new bells and whistles on it i'm seeing a, a disadvantage in some cases of planting into a a solid seeded cover crop and that that's especially magnified if you would wait until the termination timing that we're dealing with on this precision planted plot you said it was a uh you mentioned early on it was a long hard winter although um in a lot of places up here it was a relatively short hard winter here we were pretty mild before we got that cold snap but before we got that cold snap, um, I, I'm not actually sure the frost ever got into the ground up here. Uh, I'm, I'm out of Lafayette. And so in some cases, and I've been hearing about this around the state, that the oats and radishes did not winter kill because they had that good snow cover. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think needs to happen? Does, does the burn down plan need, need to be altered? as far as that goes to make sure you pick up those oats and radishes if they may not have terminated. Um, and if there's also cereal rye in that mix, you know, what do you do? How do, how do you, how do you, how do you move forward with that? Uh, or what do you change? I, I think that's a real good question. And that just points out the, the need to approach this for, with, with flexibility because every year is different. Your planting dates uh, for the cover crop in the in the fall is going to change. The fall weather can have a tremendous impact on the on the cover crop growth. The the winter, you know, every everything that can do that. So I think that you know we need to go into this one and have an idea about what needs to what needs to happen. But we always we also need to not be stuck in our on our ways because. Uh, you know, if we think that this year is going to be like next year, we're probably going to get into a, a pain in the neck at, at some point to deal with. But, you know, I think that that look just observing the season is going to be the a big thing. And I think that in, in the cases where we've got uh, radishes and oats and things that are growing in our row zone in this particular plot uh, area, you know, we might look at, at terminating a little bit earlier or planning earlier because where we've been planning, pushing our planning window late just to make it uh, a challenge to the cover crop. If we see that something's going to offset that, you know, too much, we've got the ability to plant earlier in, in our system. But <clears throat> yeah, I think we're in a, you know, if I was in a whole field situation where I had uh, radish, especially that was continuing to grow, I would want to look at some strategy to maybe terminate that a little bit earlier than I, I normally would have just to keep those uh, gigantic uh, tuber holes from uh, forming out in the in the field but the, those are things that we've got to just have flexibility for and manage accordingly every year looks like we lost your video um but we do just have one last question and then uh, I think we're at our time, but um, have you looked at corn row position relative to the previous soybean row? So do you put the corn row on the old bean row or do you put the corn row between the old bean rows? Okay, in this, in this particular situation, that that isn't so much of an issue because we're plant we're we plant the corn cover crop project <clears throat> in like like we've shown today 
and then we'll come in, in in the fall and we will drill a solid seeded cover crop to go into beans next year and in both in both locations that we're dealing with we drill those those beans so we're going narrow road drilled across that so it's not like we're planting 30 inch beans uh, through through there so that's not been a, a situation or a consideration in our particular in environment here I think one one thing though that I we haven't talked about that I would like to touch on just just briefly here is the the need for uh, a planter to have a starter uh, some some form of starter nitrogen in, in that it, anytime we're planting corn and cover crops are involved uh, you know they're the cover crop growing in whatever relation to the row is going to do a good job of sequestering uh, nitrogen and uh, the corn is going to need a little bit of shot and sometimes we can get that uh, you know, if we've got some pop-up with an in-furrow and we pair that with a, an early uh, side dress or other supplemental nitrogen, that's <clears throat> that's great. Uh, but we can, uh, you know, or if it's a two-by-two two at a bigger shot or something like that, we need to have some plan of, of supplemental early nitrogen in these in these systems. You know. That's a that's a great point, John, and one we see, I mean, as you well know, across almost all of our cover crop systems is is to be ready with some starter nitrogen and some supplemental nitrogen. Um, and, and nutrient management is a huge part of cover cropping systems because it's such a different system than what we may be used to. Um, so thank you very much, John. I that is all the questions we have.